Sometime between the 6th and 4th centuries BCE in modern-day Nepal, the son of a wealthy king was born. This baby, Siddhartha Gautama, would one day become the man we know as the Buddha. As the story goes, the wealthy prince grew up within the sheltered walls of his palace, knowing only a life of wealth and privilege. At the age of 29, he left his home for the first time to meet his subjects and was shocked to see the misfortune and suffering of others. Upon confronting the realities of aging, disease, and death, he entered a period of reflection, questioning whether his wealth would truly bring him happiness. This resulted in him leaving his fortunate life for that of a beggar and an ascetic. His spiritual journey led him to enlightenment, and along the way he accumulated a following of people who gathered from near and far to hear his teachings. His teachings, centered around relinquishing human suffering, spread across the Indian subcontinent. Over time, his teachings developed into the organized theology of Buddhism. Originally, there were approximately 25 schools of Buddhism, each with its own interpretations and practices. Although some schools attribute godlike qualities to the Buddha, his teachings discourage the idolization of any one teacher or being. During the first century BCE, the Mahayana school developed in northern India, and it continues to be the dominant form of Buddhism today in Nepal, China, Tibet, Japan, Mongolia, Korea, and Vietnam. It is also the school most popular in the West. Like many other Indian belief systems, Buddhism entails the belief in karma, or the idea that our actions, perceptions, and experiences create positive and negative energies that we carry with us and that affect our lives. Buddhists also believe in reincarnation, or a cycle of life, death, and rebirth of a soul-like entity. Buddhists call this seemingly endless cycle samsara, which is also considered to be the root of human suffering. Liberation from the cycle of reincarnation, or nirvana, comes from a spiritual enlightenment in which one is able to fully understand the nature of samsara and transcend it in a permanent, fully blissful state of being. Furthermore, they believe that the root of the cycle of samsara is ignorance of the understanding of the true nature of reality, of what is called shunyata. Shunyata is the emptiness from which all phenomena arise and exist, but we'll get to that later. So what makes Buddhism so receptive to new followers of all walks of life and all areas of the world? Unlike most religions, Buddhism focuses on a way to view the world, to understand reality, and to set followers on a path towards happiness and away from suffering. Rather than instructing followers in how they must behave or worship, it encourages seeking, questioning, and free inquiry. At its origins, Buddhism was not an organized religion, but rather a method of psychological understanding of the world through spirituality. In fact, in many ways, the Buddhist path towards enlightenment parallels that of a scientist towards a conclusion. This investigative nature of examining the world may be the root behind the many parallels that can be found between the theology and modern science. One Buddhist text, the Kalama Sutta, recounts one of Siddhartha Gautama's teaching in which he advocates logical reasoning and respects to morals and spirituality. Upon arriving in a small town, the villagers gather to hear him speak. They tell him that many teachers have come to them, each with their own views and practices claiming to know the one truth, and that all other teachers were misleading them. They ask the Buddha how they are to know which teacher is correct. The Buddha tells them to be doubtful and question all teachings and not to believe somebody just because they appear to be wise, learned, or show their own doctrines. He then tells the villagers to question these teachers in a way that actually mirrors the scientific method. When making a scientific conclusion, one is to make observations that lead to a hypothesis and then make a prediction based off of this hypothesis. Then one is to conduct an experiment testing this prediction. In this way, a scientist can reject or accept a hypothesis with scientific accuracy. The Buddha tells the villagers to consider greed, hatred, and delusion, and to think about whether they lead to the benefit or harm of mankind, and for them to consider whether the effects of these qualities are harmful or not. He then asks them to contextualize these qualities in real-life situations to see if they may lead a person to commit blamable actions or crimes. Finally, they are to make their own conclusions about whether or not these qualities will result in harm or not, and if they should be avoided or practiced. He goes on to tell them to apply a similar method to logically decide whether or not the information any spiritual teacher is presenting to them is valid. Buddhism deals less with moral codes dictating behaviors and more with an internal journey of love and compassion leading towards spiritual enlightenment. Central is the idea that the understanding of the true nature of reality is the key to achieving nirvana. Buddhists believe that within the ultimate reality is the conventional reality that we interact with in our daily lives. All things that exist conventionally are empty of true existence and exist as illusions of reality. That isn't to say that these things are hollow or mirages. This means that they are not things within themselves. They are not indestructible, indivisible, and permanent. Buddhists believe that the true nature of reality is one of emptiness from which all phenomena and aspects of the conventional reality arise. This emptiness is called shunyata. But then how do these phenomena we interact with every day appear and arise from this emptiness? 
Buddhists say that there are three modes of existential dependence. That is to say that there are three ways in which all things or phenomena arise and exist in conventional reality. 1. Through causes and conditions. 2. Through parts that make up a whole. And 3. Within the mind that is perceiving the phenomena. Let's break down and examine these three modes of dependence. Number 1. Causes and conditions. Take a flower, for example. It exists because a seed was planted and water was absorbed from the soil and energy was absorbed from the sun. Not only does this flower exist because of causes, but each of these causes have their own causes, and those causes have their own causes, and so on and so forth, until eventually all causes and conditions can be traced back to other causes and conditions in an endless cycle, in which there is nothing that exists as a thing in itself. Nothing is causeless. Number two, parts that make up a whole. This one is also relatively straightforward. Let's examine that same flower. Is it truly a flower? Is a flower one individual entity that exists within itself? No, it's comprised of a petal, a stem, and roots. And each of these parts is made up of more parts, such as cells, organelles, DNA, molecules, and so on and so forth. Just like nothing is causeless, nothing is indivisible. Number three, the mind perceiving the phenomena. The world as we experience it is merely a reflection of the physical world on the human mind. Everything we experience with our five senses is individual to us as a species. Take colors, for example. In reality, colors are just waves of light bouncing off of an object. When these waves of light enter our eyes, our eyes transmit signals to the brain and the brain produces the sensation of color. So when you're not looking at the sky, is it still blue? No. The color only exists within your consciousness. It is an internal experience. Outside of the mind, colors don't exist. They are internal interpretations of external stimuli. The same can be said for each of our five senses. However, this concept goes even further than just the illusions of color, sound, and smell, and is seen even in the smallest known particles of the physical world, subatomic particles. In physics, a subatomic particle's location is not expressed as a distinct place in space, but rather as a range of potential locations. Furthermore, these particles only seem to adopt a distinct location when observed. This theory is exemplified in British physicist Thomas Young's famous 1801 double slit experiment. In this experiment, an electron is fired through a board with two slits in it onto a photocapturing sheet on the other side. When observed, an electron seems to exist in a distinct place as a particle. So one would predict that when fired through the slits, the electron would hit the sheet having traveled through the slit in a somewhat straight line. However, this was not the case. Electrons appear to have traveled in an interference pattern onto the photo sheet. This is not the way we would expect a particle to behave. In fact, this is the way that a wave of energy should behave. If a wave had been fired through the slits, we would expect it to split off into two waves that intersect on the other side, creating a pattern exactly like the one we saw when the electrons were fired. But how can this be? How can something that we have observed as a particle travel as a wave? Physicists call this phenomenon wave-particle duality. In a sense, the electron exists and travels as a wave until observed, and at that point, the spread out indistinct location of the electron becomes distinct and quantifiable to a certain degree. It behaves as a particle. The physical act of observing the subatomic particle changed its very behavior. This experiment further exemplifies the effect of the observer on conventional reality. All phenomena we observe in conventional reality can be thought of as waves in the ocean. Waves are impermanent and ever-changing. They do not exist as separate bodies, but instead as figments on the surface of the ocean. They arise and exist due to causes such as wind and the gravity of the moon. They are comprised of a million little parts of water molecules, and their properties, blueness, wetness, and coldness are all internal experiences of the observer. At the end of the way, this wave does not exist as a thing in itself. Instead, it is an impermanent figment of the ocean as a whole, rising and falling in and out of existence. In the same sense, all phenomena are figments of the empty nature of reality, rising and falling in and out of shunyata. Now that we've established that these particles parallel certain logics, let's take it even further and see how they hold up against quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a branch of mechanics that seeks to mathematically describe the motion and interaction of subatomic particles. Beginning in the 1920s, scientists have been trying to explain and quantize the electromagnetic field, an energy field extending indefinitely throughout space that is produced by electrically charged objects. Major breakthroughs by physicists such as Werner Heisenberg and Paul Dirac led to the development of the quantum field theory, or QFT. QFT states that the physical universe is actually comprised of a myriad of invisible fields that extend throughout the universe. Each field pertains to a different type of elementary particle, such as muons and electrons. Subatomic particles, the very building blocks of the physical world, arise and exist on these fields. The localization of energy on a field is what we understand to be one of these particles.
Take the electron, for example. The localization of energy on the electron field is, in a sense, an electron. These fields can interact with each other and can pass energy from one to another. This may explain how subatomic particles seem to appear and disappear. We can draw many parallels between Shunyata and these quantum fields. Shunyata could be considered an endless field of possibility on which the conventional reality interacts with itself to sustain its impermanent and ultimately empty existence. The arising of phenomena and the arising of subatomic particles are impermanent entities existing due to causes and observation by the mind, as we explored with wave-particle duality. As an ancient Buddhist text so elegantly puts, form does not differ from emptiness, emptiness does not differ from form. Ultimately, the nature of our reality can be viewed through many lenses. Through one of spirituality, math, science, and self-reflective discoveries alike, and all understand the same concepts with slightly different constructs surrounding them. In essence, the methods through which we understand our world may seem fundamentally different from each other. However, they are more like two sides of the same coin that can add and augment to our own individual understandings.